Welcome to Discastia, a podcast for parents and teachers about the best way to support kids living with learning difficulties. I'm Michael Shanahan. And I'm Bill Hansbury, and it's early, Michael. It's early morning. It's 6.30 on a beautiful Adelaide morning. And today we're talking about how to choose a primary school. But before we start, we'd like to acknowledge that we're casting to you from the traditional lands of the Ghana people and pay our respects to Elders past and present. Beautifully done, Michael. Now, Bill. Yes, Michael. You've written an amazing blog post on your website. <laughs> it's, it's long. <laughs> it's a long blog post but because it needs to be long because there's a lot of information that you need to get out there. Um, and so we've decided to dissect that post and make it accessible for people and then they'll be able to read the rest of the post, read the post for the details. But I think, I truly think it's amazing. Oh, you're very kind, oh, look, Michael. I read a lot of stuff and I listen to a lot of podcasts and I don't think I've found a single place where all my questions have been answered. This is why it's long because it's so thorough. So I really think it's worth looking at um, and having a chat about today. Did I really answer all of your questions? Are you just being yeah. nice? No, no, I'm not being nice. <laughs> I thought it was amazing. I I actually listened to it rather than yes, reading it. Fair enough. And uh, I was thinking, oh my god, this is fantastic. So yeah, oh. I, I think it's great and worth talking about. I'm going to keep working with you. I think <laughs> I think we'll keep you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is how I keep you coming back. See, I just feed your <laughs> ego. <This is> great. <laughs> Excellent. Keep it coming. Uh. So, he- here's the basic problem we're talking about in the blog, which mm. is how to choose a school for a primary school kid, mm. particularly a primary school kid living with dyslexia, dyscalculia, um, dysgraphia. dysgraphia. Mm. Um, because this is a really important choice. The parents make because yeah. the school can make a massive difference to a kid um, and yes. how they develop, particularly in the early years. So, as a parent, you want to go in eyes open mm. and make some great choices. Now, I've been one of these parents and I've spent a long time going through multiple school tours and principal tours. And to be honest, I didn't really know what questions I should be asking yeah. or how – because they do like a sales pitch, don't they? Oh, yeah. And yeah. I've never been to a principal's tour or a school tour that said, look, we're just an average school. Yeah. <laughs> they all say we are the best school at this, we're the best at that, yeah. we do this, we do that. They talk the talk, but then there have been a few occasions for me personally where we've got into that school and it's been a very different picture yeah. once yeah. we've started. Yeah. And so – Really today, we're, the first part of what we're talking about is what sort of questions should we be asking mm. and what sort of answers should we be expecting to get? Yeah, yeah. So in your blog post, you have put in some – so to start with kind of the negative. Yep. In the blog post, you've put in some red flags. Yes. So if we're going to a school, we're talking to a principal. Are you imagining this is part of a tour? Or that this is like a one-on-one. This, I, when I wrote this, I was imagining a one-on-one. So some mm. poor school leader is fair dinkum getting a grilling, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, and and <laughs> a polite one, but you know, there's so much at stake here. So um, no, you wouldn't want to be that parent uh, in among a busy tour asking these types of questions. I think that would just be awkward for all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of those like awkward, awkward. You bring the room to silence. Yeah, yeah. You'd be, you'd be, you'd be that person on the tour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're having a one-on-one. You've put in your blog post six red flags. Yes. So here I am. I'm a parent talking to teacher, principal about coming to this school. And I'm saying, can you tell me about how reading and spelling is taught here? Yep. Now, we're focusing on reading and spelling here, but I think these principles still apply to dysgraphia and dyscalculia yes. and maths. Even though we're not specifically talking about them, these same sort of answers yeah. that you would expect to hear, yes. I think, apply across the spectrum. Well, I mean, I did pick reading and spelling, um, but Michael, we know that if spelling isn't at a certain level, there's just nothing left over in cognitive workspace to write well yep. for a lot of kids unless there's assistive software involved. So reading and spelling is the start of it all for, yeah. for me I, anyway. Yeah. yeah, and even as we've discussed before, incredibly important for maths. Yes, that's right. Correct, yeah. yeah. Yes. And so 
that's a big preamble, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's get into it. <laughs> let's do it. Um, so I'm here. I'm sitting and I'm saying, can you tell me how reading and spelling is taught here at mm, the school? Mm. And what's the first red flag we should be looking out for? And, well, oh, gee, I had fun writing these <laughs> because it took me back to my. It took me back to the end of my teacher training and the first few years of my teaching and the claptrap that um, I heard around the place. And I didn't know it was claptrap at the time, but mm. we the we believe answers, right? Now, so I, I said to be aware of anything that begins with we believe and for the very simple reason, um, science of reading or or any kind of rigorous science of anything doesn't give to hoots what you believe. You know, mm. it, 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 the only defensible way to um, to justify our practice is is based on some good research, right? So we believe is a red flag um, because it's this collective ideological cult type of answer, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, to a question, I'm not. Look, I'll be straight out there, Michael. I'm not into educational setups based on ideology. Yeah. Some people are all power to them. In my experience, I don't find that these places are strong teachers of literacy. Right. And so as the detective parent here, yes. because, because the school is being sold to me, yes. I need to be able to read in between the lines yes. of what people are saying. So this yeah. is a red flag because if the first thing coming out of the teacher's mouth is something that's based on a belief. We believe here, yeah. Then it's maybe a little red flag to say, oh, hold on a sec, is, is this just based on fluffy yeah. beliefs? And I suppose I need to separate this out. Mm. The we believe stuff is, prob- is perfectly okay in a lot of areas. But when we're talking about um, biologically secondary knowledge, stuff that we were never meant to do, like reading and spelling, yep. something we're not built for, we know, and the evidence has told us, there is a certain way to teach that that gets the job done better. I, I, so we've got to be careful, I think, in schools about what parts of our school life or curriculum we uh, allow beliefs to dictate our pedagogy or our approach and what parts of our curriculum we are going to stick yeah, so that's a good yeah, distinction, so, isn't it? We're talking. Yeah. We are specifically talking about reading. Well, here. we are in this situation, yeah. but but when I say that, I'm thinking about uh, teaching of mathematics. Mm. Now, in this blog, I go after inquiry in yep. in no small way. Yep. Now, it turns out it, it seems to be turning out that inquiry is basically ideological. Mm. Um, it's got you look at John uh, Professor John Hattie's work. It's got a really low effect size when compared with other really explicit, direct um, forms of teaching things. Mm. You okay, know? yeah. So yeah. we'll talk. We'll talk more about those. We will. Yes. Effect sizes. So, so that's the first red flag. Yep. Number one, yep. if you're in an environment where it's like we believe, yes, this. It's not necessarily going to be bad. No, no, it just depends it let, what we're talking about. It just makes your radar pick up a sec. Oh, hold on a sec here. Yeah. This, what, what is it you're believing here? Yes, yes. Because <laughs> remember, maybe they believe in science. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, if they go, we believe that reading should be taught to the science, to the, to yeah. the evidence and yep. the consensus of evidence, that's a, that's a we yep. believe statement I'm completely yep. on board with, Michael. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, <laughs> red flag one. <laughs> red flag two. Yes. We promote a love of reading. Now, I... I fiddled with this last night. This I, I changed the first sentence. This is an overused trope. Yep. Okay. Um, it's been with oh crikey, I remember saying it myself. We've got to promote love of reading. Got to what nonsense. Look, yeah. there are kids who will learn to love reading really early and they're gonna be the ones that probably find it easy and have reading modelled and can someone put some some content in front of them they love. Now, I'm an adult. Mm. who is not dyslexic. I hated reading. Yeah. Right, I only did it when I absolutely had to. Yep. So uh, yeah and and I'm a, I'm a proficient reader now and and like I say in the blog I'd, you know I tell you what I'd rather a bad day on the golf course than a good day with a book. Really? <laughs> even even today. Yeah. Um re- look I read I read professionally. I probably read one non-fiction a year. Yeah. And I do enjoy it when I do, but unfortunately reading just kicks off my serotonin and puts me to sleep. Oh. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> you know, you're reading the wrong thing. Oh, maybe I am. <laughs> no, there is stuff. There, I have had a few page turners, but look, most of my reading is in this field. Um, yeah. I, I never could say I was a lover of reading, mm. and there are pr- plenty of 
uh, proficient readers who would say the same. And I just think it's a it's a thoughtless thing to trot out. And by the way, if we do promote the love of reading, what are you talking about? Mm. How do we do that? Do we make kids do silent reading where the kids you and I deal with, Michael, look at the pictures or look at the clock yep. or act out? Yeah. You know, I mean, what the heck does this even mean? Mm. But it's a it's a lovely platitude which makes educators feel good. Mm. Uh, sells a lot of um, children's books. Yep. Yeah, I just I just think it's one of those things we it comes out of our mouth without much thought. I wonder if they're talking about a love of stories, like a love yeah. of literacy, a love of being taken away into your imagination and experiencing those yeah. beautiful rich worlds. But you don't have to read to do that. No, like, you don't. Because I listen to audio books. Yes. And it does the same thing yeah. for me as reading. Yes. And I truly love a great story. Yes. I, I, I so guess we do. I suppose yeah. that could be love of reading, but the actual act of reading itself. Yeah. I'm like you. I'm like, oh, like I, could, I couldn't read this blog post. Yes. Yes. Because <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> oh, there's too much to read. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, but some people can just read. But that's because for me it's an effort. Like yeah, I know yeah. that if I read it at the end of it, I would be you'll exhausted. Be, you'll be hammered. Yeah. 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 That, <laughs> um, look, there's another reason I have an issue with this love of reading stuff um, because it, it's one of the criticisms that folks who advocate for a very structured way to teach reading and spelling, mm. uh, it's one of the criticisms we cop. Uh, people will say if you're into structured synthetic phonics and a very explicit way of teaching it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you are taking the love of reading away from children. You know, so yeah. there are these, there are these schools mm. full of crying children saying, "Can't you just return the love of reading to yeah. me?" Oh, you know, this phonics is awful, which is not true. Yeah, but that's you know, it's one of I, I think it's one of the straw man arguments that's put up around a structured versus a less structured way of teaching this. Yeah, so yeah. it's a red flag. Yes, because it could be indicating that this person you're talking to is on the uh, non-science side of the fence because this is a common argument that they use against structured yes, synthetic yes. phonics. They so, just yeah. say it just is boring, yes. repair, like uh, easy text, yeah. there's no good literature. No, you know, that's the kids right. are it's just all... reading really basic, boring things. That's right. And so that's bad because we want to promote a love of reading. Yes. So that's why that's a red flag because it could indicate it could. a non-science of reading approach, not because we think no. there's anything bad about reading. Or, no, 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 you know, not at all. And that people do develop a love of reading. Yeah. Some people. Some people. <laughs> as, as, as we discuss this, Michael, and you get got a, such a beautiful way of dissecting the stuff, I'm just realising that this blog was just a pouring out of all my biases and annoyances <laughs> 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 and, and probably an expression of my shame for being one of the people that trotted this stuff out for a long time. But I, anyway. I think that's okay, though. Like, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, uh, putting your emotions out there about it because it really is a very emotive topic. Yeah, I guess it is. And well, it's, yeah. it's very hard to stay completely neutral on something that is such a heated debate yeah, for yeah. so many years. Yeah, yeah. For so many years, hasn't it? Yes, well, it's it's, it's the reading wars yeah. go on. And yeah. so there we go. Number two, love of reading. Love of reading. Be, Be careful. Just because it's a red flag, because it's something that people often say yeah. who are non-science of reading. Yes. So don't freak out when you hear it. Just perhaps go investigate it. What do you mean by that? Yeah. What does yeah. that what does that look like in a what does that look like in the classroom? You know? Yeah. What does that look like around what you'll be sending home? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Number three, different teachers teach reading and spelling differently. Yeah. Now watch that one. On the surface level, that is a problem. I don't believe that needs investigation. So for me, that is saying it is Rafferty's here, right? Um, this stuff we're teaching at different levels. What's of Rafferty's here? Rafferty's rules. Oh. Yes. Yeah, there's an old saying around whatever goes. Yeah. Um, in the blog, I called it choose your own adventure. Yeah. Um, and I borrow that from Trav Bartlett, a colleague of mine. Look, um, this one's got layers, but we know um, that there's we know that the schools that are doing the really good stuff, Michael and Bentley West Primary School in Victoria comes to mind, where I learned a term low curriculum variance, mm -hmm. and that just basically means that. If you look at what's happening at one year level in one classroom and compare it to that classroom at that year level across the hall, the same stuff's being taught at pretty much the same time 
And if you've got a methodology that works in pretty much the same way, you don't want one year two class over here, way up here at doing this, that and the other and the other class still down. That, that's bonkers, right? Any Anyone who works in any industry where there are standards would go, that's a problem. Yep. It's a problem in education. So Bentley West lowered their curriculum variance. Very de- deliberate planning and action to make sure that you don't miss out, Michael, just because you get this teacher and I have a great year too because I get this teacher because one teacher happens to be teaching in line with evidence and one teacher's getting the kids to cut up sentences. Mm. Right? Yep. So that's... That, yeah, that's that's one to watch out for. Now, look, what happens there though is I've got a there's a criticism, um, I guess, of this type of lowering curriculum variance that goes what you kill all teacher agency, you take the teachers right away to make professional decisions about how things are taught. Now, listen, if you've got a concern as a teacher, I've watched teachers work within low curriculum variance environments and have plenty of room, mm-hmm. right? To, yep. to do it their own way. Yeah. It, when you get inside it and you watch it, it's, it's not a problem. But, you know, I guess teacher unions can be one of the first groups to freak out and go, well, hang on, why do you train these people well if you're just going to make them act like robots? This is not what it is. Yeah. It's I, doing, doing what works. I think, and I think one of the issues here is it's just how it sounds. Yes. You know, if I'm out there as a parent choosing a school, it's not a very enticing sales pitch if the school says oh we just teach every kid the same thing yeah <laughs> in every class like yeah. it sounds no, it's like not. it kind of sounds well that sounds boring yeah but, but you know as uh, you know compared to oh we have a huge variety you know kids can work at their own level that all sounds buzzwordy oh, it's so a la carte, isn't it yeah it sounds it sounds like a better sales pitch yeah yeah but what you're saying is hold on a sec yeah there needs to be more discipline than that yes and i think of your comment then because before we started recording today we were just comparing notes on how we teach um, algebra, algebra yeah. like the beginnings of algebra. <laughs> and what I find, like, because we work, you and I work to an incredibly structured program. Yes. Like we have step one, you know, yeah. teaching point one, two, three, and it's all structured and you stick to the structure and you trust the structure. Yet when we get together, most of what we talk about is, oh, how do you teach this one? Yeah. How do you go about this? Yeah. And, you know, when I've gone to my trainings, um, there have been a huge variety of how you get across the information yes. for, for the same teaching point. Yes. So, if anything, it provides an opportunity to be more creative because you're not having to think about the content. You are able to focus on how you're getting oh, that content across. What a point. To the kids that you're working yes. with. Yes. So you've that that yeah that is really really well put, um, and, and you know it speaks to it actually speaks to teachers' cognitive load. Um, we, we you know we take groups of teachers through Salisbury Primary School here in South Australia, which is an absolute exemplar. I, I I was dubious that they could be doing things as well as Bentley West, and then we took a group of teachers through, and I went wow. Now Bentley all Bentley are a few years ahead. Yep. Um, but this is incredible. Anyway, the principal, I was, um, I think I was interviewing the principal and, no, just just the principal uh, for the talk I did for the Literacy Guarantee Unit, the Teach Them All as if you're dyslexic and teach them all better. And she said, our young teachers say the structured part of the day is their favourite part of the day where they teach because they know exactly what they have to teach uh, and in some cases how it's going to be taught. Um, they relax, the kids relax because the routine is predictable and tight and it is and it is the most effective effective and enjoyable part of the day for these young teachers and it really made me reflect on boy oh boy. So what if you're not lucky enough as a young teacher to be in a school like that mm. and it is, look, just put, hand your program up at the end of term one but other than that, uh, do it how you want. Mm. Yeah. Got me it, reflecting. Mm. Yeah. And as you say, you know, we also need to remember, of course, that this is about the kids. And well, that's so right. having that consistency, no matter what teacher you have or no matter what your yes. class you're in, yes. th- 
if you think about that logically, well, that's got to be better for the kid that they're not yeah. being pushed around and you know changed no. and taught something different depending no, on what right. teacher they've got. So, yeah, and you're right, Michael. It's not it's not highly marketable, but I, the big part of this blog is asking parents to be smarter mm. and to see through that marketing, which I think puts up a, a problematic view of what goes on in an innovative achieving school. Mm. Right, I, I dare a school out there. I seriously, on a parent, on a principal's tour to go. Look, you won't see this here. You won't see free range classrooms with kids walking around with iPads all the time. You won't see this a la carte. Oh, I feel like learning this now. Oh, I feel like learning this now. You will see kids at tables. You will see furniture. You will see a lot of the time the teacher at the front teaching. You will see kids doing worked examples. Mm. You will oh, see teachers see, checking their understanding. As a parent, now I'm thinking, oh, this sounds boring. Oh, this is, yeah. I mean, this is the this is the problem, isn't it? You well, know, with the, parents smarten up. With, yeah, with the. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, uh, I do marketing as, yeah, as yeah. a big part of my job, and it's true. You know, you do want to make it sound good because I'm yes. in the sales mode at the moment, and you want to. Uh, you want to kind of meet the customer, yes, the parent, where they might be in their understanding of yeah, it. And yeah. it is unfortunately, like you, you have to have experience with education to understand why what you're saying yes. m- is meaningful and good. Yes. And not many, unless you've been a teacher, you don't have that experience. And so... It is a hard it is a hard thing for parent for teachers to sell, isn't it? Look, Michael, we humans do spot genuine engagement mm. on another human's face pretty well. I, I don't think you need a, an, a, an expert level. You know when a kid's switched on and learning. You know when they're looking at the right spot. We also know what bored kids look like. Okay, um, and sometimes I've seen in many schools kids develop a boredom through having um, too much choice mm. um, about what they do so look i i am I, i'm putting i'm basically daring schools out there to go uh actually you won't see this marketing from us we're not going to talk to you about how schools a la carte and children scratch around a large open area like chooks mm. <laughs> <laughs> with their ipads <laughs> under their arm you know um Come on, schools, you know, you can back this. You can talk about human cognitive architecture. You can talk about cognitive load and you can talk about attention. You know what gets the job done when we have to, there are times of the day when we just have to teach. Hmm. person who knows stuff really well imparts the knowledge and that doesn't happen on the free range, you know. So back yourselves. Yeah. I think one of the, look, I think marketing and I'm talking to a man across the table who's a marketer, <laughs> I kind of rue the day when marketing got really heavily involved with schools, but it had to because schools are competing yeah. for kids. And I think NAPLAN has contributed a huge amount to that. Well, it, it, look, it set has. up that competitive environment. Uh, and in the UK, they'll say Ofsted's done the same thing. Mm. Um, I guess you're right. Mm. But I'm looking, I'm looking for the purple cow, to use a Seth Godin. I'm looking for that school to go, <laughs> no, we don't. That's not how we want to project ourselves. Um, our NAP plan will speak for itself, by the way. Mm. Um, you know, our, our intervention setup will speak for itself. Um, yeah. yeah. Come and so, have a look. Yeah. So, this is just another red flag. This isn't yeah. like, you know, some sort of checklist where you can say, does this, does that. No. But it's just what are you looking for? Yeah. And really, it sounds like we're trying to get inside the head. We're trying to get of the person we're talking to, we're trying to get past the sales pitch. Exactly. To the nitty-gritty of, but hold on a sec, what does this yeah. look like in a classroom? Yes. So, red flag number four, not all students learn to read and spell the same way. What is that? Why is that a red flag? Um, well, because they kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on to the next point. Um, yeah. No, no look, um, timelines vary depending on... Um, you know, the student's uh, predisposition to, you know, the job the brain, the massive job the brain's got to do when it bolts on reading and spelling because it bolts it on. It's not natural. Um, but we know and we've known for a very long time there are stages of spelling and reading development. Um, you know, and we've talked about it before, if you aren't phonemically proficient, you will struggle with phonics. Mm. If you haven't locked in basic code, you're going to struggle with blending. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, 
now that's a very oversimplified. I'm not going to bore parents with the. I probably couldn't rattle them off anyway. Yeah. But in fact, kids do learn to read and spell get passing through the same broad stages. Yep. Okay. Um, and that's just that is just fact. Yeah. So when you hear something like that, well, watch out and again say, can you explain what what you mean? Mm. You know. I think something related to this, which you hear often, is we work out whether this kid's a visual learner mm. or a kinesthetic learner mm. or an auditory learner. Yeah. Um, and so that, to me, is part of this red flag yeah. of not really understanding that, hold on a sec, we yeah. all do actually learn the same way. Yes. Just at a different pace. Yes. And some kids need more repetition. Yes. Some kids might need much more explicit instruction. Yeah. But they're not learning in a different way. No. It's no. just a bit more fine grained. Yes. With more more work. It look, um, learning styles, right? We mm. talked about them in education for years. And you know, to say to a parent we cater for different learning styles, doesn't that sound sexy? Yeah, you know, it does. that's that's that, that makes me want to heavy, heavy breathe in the microphone. Mm. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but learning styles have been debunked. Yeah. Okay. They're actually not a thing. But Michael, you talked about visual, auditory, and kinesthetic uh, channels. And, and, and anyone who knows anything about multisensory learning knows if we can pitch something and engage a kid through those channels, um, if one doesn't pick it up, the other might. Now, yes. this is another episode, what VAK means yeah. and multisensory learning means, but that is not learning styles. Yes, but they sound very similar, don't that, that's they? That's right. Y- yes. So, so you know, learning styles is where you do, you know, some people self-identify and they say, oh, I'm a visual learner. Yeah, yeah. And so you've got to give me everything as pictures because yes. I won't understand it if you say it to me. If you just blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes. yes. And th- I think when learning styles first came in, there were even – tests you could do That's that right. put you in a box of yeah. what style of learner you are. Yes. Uh, it 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 all sounds logical. Yeah. But it's, it's nonsense. And it's not that it's just not yeah. that simple, is it? No. Yeah, yeah. But no, it, it, learning styles are gone. Mm. Thank goodness. Um so it's a red flag if you hear someone talking like that. Uh, look, I believe so anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I'm not an expert I, I'm by no means an expert on this stuff. I, you know, you ask one person what do they mean when they talk about learning styles, mm. and and someone might go, oh, well, probably I'm talking about VAK. You yeah. know, pitching it certain ways to certain kids because what might not go in one channel might go in the other, but those channels can swap for kids. Mm. You know, you and I have worked with kids, and uh, for one day the kids working. You're explaining stuff and they're understanding it, and then the next day the kid comes in and they're looking at you, and you just take them over to the word cracker and you go, Look, "Let's move it around." Yep. But even when you're doing something like that, you're still talking. Mm. So there's some kinesthetic movement of stuff. They're still talking. They're still seeing. So I mean, you, you work across. When do, when don't you work across channels? Yeah, really? Not unless you like sit there and get the kids to block their ears. And put a blindfold on. <laughs> yeah. Now listen to what I say. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah so it. it there's no, but it is a red flag, isn't it? If, yeah, if people yeah. start talking about learning styles oh, and yeah. so on, Run. then yeah, Run. then, then no. this is this <laughs> is not there. a school that's embraced science. No, no, no. Okay, so uh, number five. Yes, students are at different points, so we don't teach them the same content the same way. Right. Okay. So. It is true. Of course it's true. Any teacher will tell you it's true. Any parent who's got more than one child will tell you that kids are at different points. Okay, that that's that's fair enough. Um, but we also know that if a school chooses a way of teaching something that is effective, I mean really effective, and by the then I mean evidence-based, and they lower curriculum variance and they make and they and they 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 try and control for a heap of variables, right? They and they make sure kids are getting the same stuff at the same year level, taught really well. What we see, understandably, is the shrinking of that gap of where kids are. Now look, 
or anyone who works in reading knows that what kids bring to school varies wildly around um, their exposure to language, their exposure to book and print and that sort of stuff. So, yes, kids Even start, their emotional state. Even the emo- – kids start at different places. Yep. But they walk into a place – they walk into a school which can have a whole heap of variables, right, or a, or a school that works hard on minimising some of those variables and I guess this is what we're talking about. So – If a school can lower curriculum variance, teach the same content at the same year level, of course there will have to be intervention for those kids who have developmental difficulties Mm. that keep them behind. So intervention is – I'm not saying if you teach everything really well, we won't need an intervention. Um, Kids will do better when schools control for what they can control for. Yep. And how to how to teach, what to teach, and when to teach things is one of those one of those things. Now I'm kind of tripping over myself here yeah. because also um, you'll hear differentiation a lot. So differentiation is what schools talk about. How do we differ? What we do with different kids? And Michael, you and I differentiate every day. Yeah. Um, schools that haven't controlled, haven't brought curriculum variants down. Teachers will tell you they have a huge range. To have to differentiate for, yeah, right, and that range may stays there. If it, if teacher A is teaching stuff differently to teacher B and different content, right, this the by the time these kids get into the into the middle years, every teacher they come across is going to have to differentiate hugely. Now I've got a problem with <laughs> I've got a problem with differentiation in that package mm. because teachers can't do it. It's as simple as that. Mm. You cannot produce a different curriculum for every kid in your class but there are people out there who bang on like teachers should and i've had a gut full of it Mm. because um that teacher's got one brain one attentional system 30 kids yeah now look i don't just shoot from the hip here when i talk about this i have been i've been lucky enough to be in these schools that are getting this stuff largely right and they will tell you, and I will see that this this variance between kids shrinks down. Um, I remember really now. I don't want to market anyone, but um, you know, if you read the book Explicit Direct Instruction mm-hmm. or EDI, uh, I think it's by Hollingsworth and Yabara. I think anyhow, we'll put, I'll put it in, it in the show there. Notes. Yep. They make the point that we actually should, from the outset, be teaching the same stuff to all the kids. Because if you if you differentiate, and I come in, Michael, and I teach you at one level, so I teach you, um, uh, I'm teaching you how to solve for X in a one-step equation, yep. but then I pull another group aside and I'm teaching them the difference between an equation and a expression. Mm. The kids down here are, if you look at it from an equity point of view, are missing out on the content. Yeah. So EDI says... You, it focuses on teaching them all the same stuff, teaching it really, really well, doing a number of worked examples, and then you can do some more work with the kids who need another few runs, another few practices, yep. or might need a bit of teaching backward behind that. Mm. Um, but they're very big on. Um, don't deny certain kids um, a certain level of teaching because you're just going to exacerbate these these variances. Mm. Um, and teachers probably listening going easier said than done but you just got to trust me on this if yeah. we start right down at the bottom and we shrink this variance we do better kids mm. do better you, you don't have this huge wide gap which you have to and I'm air quoting massively differentiate for later on mm. and it's not it, yes trust you Bill but it's not it's not you saying this there's a big body of evidence yeah. and research that shows this is the case Te- teach it really really mm. well check for understanding if you've got a group of kids that aren't getting it you might just reteach the whole class because you see the repetition doesn't kill anyone else hmm. it really doesn't yep. some kids might go to sleep but um, parents you got to understand one teacher 30 kids teacher's got one brain yep <laughs> it is really tough. Yeah. And so what are we looking for here as the parent? We're in this interview. Yes. And you hear someone saying students are at different points, so we don't teach them the same content the same way, or something along those lines yeah. of like, yeah, you know, in a class we do different things depending mm. on where mm. kids are at. That's a red flag. Yes. And I guess the next question is, 
So what subject areas are you talking about? So give me an example in maths or, or you know, you're teaching kids how to write a paragraph. What does that mean? And then the next question is, well, how does the poor old teacher handle that? Mm. So I guess that is the sniffing out for this, yeah. again, this low curriculum variance, Michael, yep. this, this everyone's doing something different. It's a complicated one, isn't it? Oh, look, it's not easy. And that's hard to no. pull apart in a quick, com- you know, conversation yeah. with a with a teacher, but or a parent, uh, I mean, a principal. Yeah. But yeah. So it it's really about getting a mindset as a parent to be sniffing out little indicators that this might not be. Yeah. Quite a scientific approach no, to it. I'm and just hearing. Some, yeah. I'm hearing buzzwords. I'm yeah. hearing trends. I'm yeah. hearing things that you want me to, you know, yes. that, that you think I want you to say yes. rather than getting down to the nitty-gritty of how does it actually work. Yeah, talk talk science of learning to me. Yeah. And yeah. then, so your last one, number six, as red flags, and after this we'll get on to what we yeah. should be hearing from teachers, which we've touched on a little bit, but um, this is a, a big one, isn't it? And this number six kind of covers off on some of the other ones we've been talking about, when we ask, when if we hear someone to say we use an inquiry approach yeah. to teaching literacy, mm. well, first, what does an inquiry approach mean? Yeah. Because we hear that a lot, yeah. but, but maybe not necessarily know what it means. And why is that a bad thing? I mean, there are yeah. schools like IB, yeah. which are based on mm. inquiry learning. Mm. So it must be a good thing, mustn't it? Isn't that a good thing? Well, it's definitely very popular. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, okay, straight off the bat, um, kids inquiring can be really powerful. Mm. So, first off, what is inquiry learning? Well, it's, it's finding out for yourself. Mm-hmm. It's having a question. Yep. And going down the rabbit hole, I guess, in inquiring, it's it's finding, oh, why does that happen the way it is? And why is that the way it is? And how, why do people think like that? And, you know. And the kids got to find the answer themselves. Yes. Using their own resources. Or they may be given a few little breadcrumbs to say, you know, you can yeah. look in these places. Bit of scaffolding. Yeah. Um, th- but they've th- got to do that work themselves. Yeah. So, it's 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 about creating an inquiring mind that, um, that questions – that is critical. Now, listen, if we didn't have inquiring minds, we'd, you know, that would be the end of democracy, wouldn't it? Mm. If you want to look at it broader. We, we do need to question. We do need to inquire. And we want to, we want to develop kids that do that. Here's the problem, though. Um, Michael, you and I have both experienced firsthand and seen kids flounder um, when a learning task is heavily based on inquiry, inquiry using print, Writing, spelling, reading, uh, and the main avenue of inquiry is to be literate or have to be literate. And 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 we've seen kids just wander around the place mindlessly, not knowing what to do, getting into trouble because what they don't have is the underlying skills to inquire with. Yes. So, inquiry has no. I don't believe inquiry has any place in teaching early literacy. Mm. Okay, because so we're saying it does have a place. Oh, it, look, it in, does in certain circumstances. It can create really rich and flexible um, mental schema for mm. stuff. Oh, I'm going to start talking about constructivism in a minute, which now I have a problem <laughs> with too, which is the stuff I got pushed down my throat. Yeah. So um, we're not saying inquiry learning is. Completely, you know, avoid it at all costs. No, no. But when we're talking about teaching, reading, spelling. Yes. Mathematics. Yes. Handwriting. Yes. Particularly for these vulnerable kids. Yes. That we're talking about. Kids living with learning difficulties. Yeah. Inquiry learning is not a good way to teach this. No. um, But, listener, don't, don't think we're saying inquiry for everyone else. And they're not for kids with difficulties. Yeah. Um, look, what's really good to have a look at is this stuff we call uh, biologically primary knowledge and then biologically secondary knowledge, right? Mm. Biologically primary knowledge. Now, I'm gonna, probably going to make a hash of this. But it is basically the stuff our brain was built to do. Mm. Okay, stuff inborn. 
But then in our culture, there's a whole heap of stuff that's secondary that we actually don't need to be able to do. Well, if you think from a, uh, you know, when we were running around on the savannas and the plains, and we didn't have to, we didn't have to learn to write, yep, or read. Okay, so yep. there are there are these skills that we now need in our culture that are secondary. They aren't absolutely. Um, they're not necessary for survival, mm. um, and yeah, so they're technologies that um, we can live live without. I mean, breathe in, breathe out, eat, reproduce without, but they are very, very important. That's the biologically secondary stuff, and that stuff needs to be taught, mm. right? Because taught we well. don't just know it. No, so you can. Yeah, that's right. So that's that's the stuff that inquiry, I don't think works. So well for G. I'm going to get. I'm. I'm feeling out of my depth yeah, here. Yeah, so let's just isn't it? let's just stick to the literacy. Yeah. Um, if you are told our kids inquire their way to becoming literate, um, no, mm. no, no, they don't. They need yes. to be taught very explicitly yeah. in a in a particular way, uh, and it makes me wince when I hear the term mm. because, yeah, it's a little bit hit and miss, isn't it? Yeah. So if you say to somebody, well, look. There's a Rubik's Cube sitting there on my desk. Yep. I've never been able to master the Rubik's Cube. Yep. <laughs> right? And so this is kind of an example for me of inquiry. You give me the Rubik's Cube and you say, work it out. Yep. Now, some people are going to work it out yep. and then get to the point where they can solve it in a minute. Yep. Some people are going to flounder with it and never get anywhere mm. with it. Mm. Or they're going to be able to do it, but never in a very efficient way. Yep. So this is what inquiry learning leads us to, doesn't it? You, you know what? I'm going to kill your example. Yeah. You ever spoken to a kid who can solve a Rubik's Cube in 20 seconds or less? Yeah. Well, what yes. What did they say to you about how they did it? Uh, I didn't ask. Oh, I did. The kid goes, I oh, know the algorithm. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. So um, basically the Rubik's Cube experts have a, an algorithm of what to do when yeah. <laughs> to solve a super... I yeah. didn't know this. I just thought they were gifted. Yeah. Um, but it is it is a it is a step process. Now, someone's inquired their way to that at some point. Yes. But kids these days, they get the Rubik's Cube. Next thing they do is they go they on look YouTube and they find the algorithms. <laughs> yeah. You know? Exactly. Well, that's my point because this is where you get this huge variability, isn't yeah. it, with yeah. inquiry learning, yes. is that some people can work it out for themselves. i got you now. Other people will flounder yeah. forever, Forev- forever, like me, like and me. never never be able to work out the That's Rubik's right. Cube. Yes. And so, and Rubik's Cube is a tiny fraction of the complication of learning to read. Yes, that's right. If it's not coming naturally for you. Yes, yes. And so, it, just expecting people to be able to work out this code... Is too much to ask. The code, it's too yes, complicated. It, it is, particularly in English. Yep. Because there are there are too many quirks. Not that it's not a code. It is still a code, but it is a complex code. English. Yeah. Mm. So this is where this becomes problematic, isn't it? You know, we can do relatively simple tasks mm. where you're confident that the kids doing it are going to inquire their way to a good answer yep. and they get that satisfaction and yes. they learn those skills of problem solving and so on. Yep. But that's not a good approach to teaching reading and writing because it is no. too complicated and a lot of them are never going to get there that way. Look, that's right, and we need. Look, I am going to have. I'm going to shoot one across the bow of inquiry in general. Right, mm-hmm. I've used it. I've seen it work beautifully, but when you look at Hattie's effect sizes, it's it's on the lowish end. Mm. Inquiry based learning. Um, there are far far more effective ways, uh, which tend to evolve around the explicit and direct stuff yep. of teaching. So, look if if you you know if you're looking at a school that's heavy on inquiry. You'd need to ask the question about, okay, inquiry, inquiry has a lowish effect size compared to other explicit ways of teaching. Tell me how your day is split up yep. between inquiry and, and other more didactic, now that just means teacher at the front teaching, uh, more didactic learning areas, and, and where do you use inquiry? Hmm. Right? And if, it's in, and if they go in the reading and writing space in the early years, I'd be out. See you later. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a qualification there. There is all of these are nuanced. I made them sound very yeah. simple, but uh, yeah. But having said that, um, having two kids that have gone to an inquiry-based learning environment, although this was, you know, in secondary, upper primary, second secondary, yep. 
they really struggled. Yeah. So living with both of them living with dyslexia, one of them living with dyscalculia, yeah. in an inquiry-based environment, they would typically come home distraught yeah. and saying, I have no idea what I'm yeah. supposed to do. Yeah. I don't even know where to start, they no. would say. Yes. And lucky for them, I suppose, they've got a teacher as a parent who can yep. sit down and say, okay, here's how we approach yeah. it. And you need to do that little bit of explicit instruction to say yes. here's how you go about it yes once they get to that point they're away and they can go and they can yeah. do it but they totally struggle with that just open slather yeah just go and solve it and i think it is a cognitive load issue oh that is know, exactly because what a lot it is. of this inquiry particularly in secondary yeah is reading yes a lot of it is go online yes and look at websites, look at Wikipedia, look at these references and yeah. try and work out the answer for yourself. Yeah. Oh, man, that, that is a tough ask for someone who struggles with reading. And have a think about all the sub-skills under that. Mm. So if you go to a kid, go to the internet, how do they know a credible source from a non-credible source? Just take the reading out of it. Um, now, I, I, I do watch schools. Now, what's popping into my head here is the research project, right, that kids in South Australia have to do for their SACE. Yep. Um, and I'm seeing that being taught better and better every day. Teachers are, schools are heavily, heavily scaffolding and stepping out and breaking up that process from go to woe. Um, so we're taking something that you could say broadly is inquiry because the kid has to come up with a research question, but it's being better taught. Mm. So there's a very, very strong scaffold inside an overarching inquiry they're um, teaching them approach. how to inquire. That's right. And that's the thing. If a kid doesn't know how to inquire, what is the point? Yeah. I think that's the missing link, isn't it? Yeah. When you just say, inquire, go ahead, Bill, inquire yes. and find this out for yourself. Go, go forth, be engaged. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll put your picture on the side of a bus yeah, with you inquiring. Right. Yeah. But there is a real process to it and you can step kids through that yes. and then it'd be more effective because now yeah. we're actually telling them how to do it. That's right. And then being able to, them being proficient readers and writers... Um, I don't know how you can inquire today mm. unless you walk to the village square and you say someone, tell me about this, you know. <laughs> That's how, you know, or you know, the ancient Greeks orated, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they stood in the square and spoke <laughs> and had to remember. But these days it's print. It's all about print, Michael. And if you don't got print, you won't inquire too well, will you? No, mm. no. So, okay. Yep. So, they're our six red flags. They're the six red flags. And... You know, in essence, we're saying, as a parent, you've got to do this detective work. Yes. And try and work out, try and suss out, is this a science-based school? Yeah. Or yeah. is this a belief kind of fluffy-based yeah. school? Yeah. And the second thing is, are they just trying to sell me something mm -hmm. here? Or is there some substance behind it? Yeah. And really, you're not going to get to the bottom of that in just a, a principal's tour, you know, with a no. whole group of people. No. You really need to get one-on-one -on -one and ask these sort of questions mm. specifically. Yeah. And I suppose gauge how much they sweat. <laughs> That's <laughs> you right. You know, when you ask those questions, yeah. they'll give you an answer, but if they're going, oh, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and so there's the red flags, mm. but what does a good school look like? So if yeah. I'm in a school and I'm asking these questions... What are the good answers? What am I on the lookout for? This might even be easier. Well, we are on, when we say a good school, we're talking about mm. how, how literacy is taught. Yes, yes. Um, so, look, first thing, are they screening kids on the way in? Are they, are they screening for um, those basic literacy skills? Are they using a, a outside of program? I mean, a good... Um, normed assessment of reading age, spelling age. Are they checking font awareness? Now, this is for the receptions yep. before they walk through the door and kids starting new. Is that is that one of the first things they do? Are they taking measures? Mm. Right? But it's interesting you say that because on all the tours I've been on, I've never heard somebody say that. No. Well, there are schools getting much, much better at this. Mm. You know, there are schools who, in reception, they will get kids in before reception and they will screen these kids and they'll know who needs intervention from the get-go. Oh, that is so brilliant because in my experience, it's the parents that's got to do that. Yeah, that's Once right. they notice a problem, yes. then they got to pay out of their own pocket to get some sort of assessment or something happening. Yeah, that's right. And I, yeah, there's the other thing. 
you know, oh, now don't get me started on that. Yes, so um, I've schools that are really good at this um, actually negate the need for the parent to go off and get um, a formal identification of anything because the school just goes, now look, uh, B- Bentley West, Sarah, as I'm, one of the first questions she asks a parent is, are there reading difficulties in the family? Yep. Quite a cutting, que- well, quite a straight to the point. Yes. But this is really important because we yes. know genetics is a factor here. Um, so, you know, by, instead of prove to me that the kid has a developmental disorder, we'll just check their performance. And if we can't, if this kid is not performing at where we would expect, well, we just pop them straight into an intervention. Mm-hmm. We target, we focus, we go hard, we go early. And a lot of these kids can be, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them can be normalised by around year three or four if they start at that school. Mm. So you see this beautiful, you know, of, I'm imagining the response to intervention pyramid. You, you need, you really needy kids get the support they need. Uh, your kids who don't have that quite that huge level of support, the kids at the top, they still get the work and they trickle back down in, eventually into the classroom because the issue has been dealt with. Mm. And, the, so, and we know the earlier that an issue is dealt with, the much it's going to be yes. much easier, and and that the gap's not going to develop. That's right. I was having a chat to a colleague the other day, uh, and the school he's working in is thinks intervention is fifteen kids all with one teacher. And I said, all they've done is created another class, mate. Um, how are you supposed to run a good tier? Th- and they call that tier three, by the way, right? I said, look, mate, just say to your boss, you got to decide. You're going to spend your money on these kids now. Or later, mm. because these kids, unless you intervene properly early, and that that is ratios of one to three, one to two, one to one for the really severe ones. Yeah, uh, if you don't spend that money now, you're going to be this kid's going to be an in intervention right the way through to year six. Yep. if you still run it. So why don't you just go hard and go early with an evidence based mm. program and an experienced teacher? And if this kids and the the global perspective is all right, if this kid's not costing your school money they'll be costing another school money because they're going to need extra support later on. Mm. So, yeah, this is this is an important one. Are they screened? Is there intervention in place? What does that intervention look like? And is it evidence-based? And what is – someone t- starts talking about tiers. Yeah. What are these tiers? So, um, I, there, there's this there's this model. I, I'll put it in the show notes. We'll yep. put it in the response to intervention, it's called. And it basically is a pyramid. And when you talk about reading, it says that um, – at the very top of the so the base of the pyramid is called tier one. So imagine this pyramid divided into thirds. Yep. Base of the pyramid is tier one. It's what goes on in all classrooms with all kids. So whenever you hear tier one or wave one, just think classroom teaching. Yep. Then there's a second tier halfway up the pyramid, which is kids who are experiencing some difficulties. Yep. Now, when we talk about our space, Michael, these kids may or may not be dyslexic, dysgraphic, dyscalculate, but they might be. Um, but those kids will get an intervention, which is usually small group, one teacher, four, five kids. Um, the teacher still can target and diagnostically teach. Um, but in the middle of the pyramid, these kids' needs, their difficulties aren't as severe as the kids at the very top. Mm-hmm. So the kids that test the lowest with your screening, the kids that look like they've got the real difficulties with phenology, may have the family history. Heck, they may even have an identification of dyslexia and it may be severe. These are the kids that get what we call the tier three intervention. And this is the game you and I are in, Michael. Um, one t- specialist teacher, and I and I say specialist teacher, schools, who are you staffing here, mm-hmm. right? Um, not not some poor teacher aid who's not who's not well trained. They get the specialist teacher and the ratios of one to one or one to two, because these kids need a style of teaching that is highly diagnostic. We need to watch them as they perform on the tasks we set them, and we are making minute by minute decisions about what the next practice activity will be and whether next session we're going back and reteaching or recovering or moving them on. Yep. So that's response to intervention, and it basically says if you, your school will end up looking like a pyramid. You will only have about three to well, three, four, five, six, seven percent of kids who need the tier three, the top, if you're teaching to the evidence at the bottom. Mm. So schools who start this journey go, my pyramid's out of whack. We've done the numbers, and we've got half our school needing tier two intervention. And you go, all right, well, what that shows you is the tier one teaching isn't evidence-based and not effective. And once it sorts out, things start to take the pyramid shape. Yep. Yep. So if if you're in this interview with a school, might that be a question to ask? What's your intervention look like? Mm. 
uh, what what ask them about the tears their tears. Well, approach. yeah. How do they do it? Yeah, and how many you, kids? Yeah. Um, gee, imagine a parent going to a principal. So is your pyramid starting to take the normal shape now? You know, you got your tier one worked out. Wow, that would even stress me as a principal with what I know. But yes, um, so. But if a school starts talking about that, you oh, think, you, okay, these you guys very are much. thinking about it. Oh, my giddy They've up. got an approach. Yes. And this is a very different answer to, oh, all kids learn differently. That's right. And if you do talk about intervention and some principal goes, we don't have the budget for that, that's not okay. Mm. You know, this, this, and I hear this all the time. When I talk to schools about what a tier three intervention looks like, I go one to one or one to two, and they go, we can't afford that. And I go, there are schools affording that everywhere. Mm. These schools are just shrewd spenders. Yep. They audited what they spend on. And some of them put an effect size against all their programs and went, well, we're not funding that one anymore. You know, this wonderful um, garden growing project or whatever it is that it costs us you know, uh, a lot, a lot to subscribe to. I'm mean, like yeah. gardening. I don't know. There's all sorts. Of, there's all sorts yeah. of non-evidence base that can go on and stuff and go on in schools. These schools have done this audit. They've gone. We're going to put our money in the right place. I had a principal say to me years ago, Bill. There's always money. Mm. It's just how you spend it. Exactly. So if you have a school leader go, oh, we don't do tier three because we can't afford it. Well, out. Mm. Go. Yeah. Don't go, go to else. that school. That's go right. somewhere else. Yeah. That takes their moral obligation to have children reading seriously. Because that's what it comes down to: Are you serious about kids being literate, or aren't you serious about kids being literate? Mm. And you can hear that you can hear the anger in my voice, Michael. Yeah, because this stuff grates me. And because it is so fundamental, the reason why we're focusing on the literacy part, on yeah. the reading and writing, is because everything else depends on it. It, it does. It is. It, it is. It is. It is the bottom of the other pyramid, mm. isn't it? And so, how can you say? In all honesty, how can you say we don't have the money for that? Yeah. How can you not have the money for the fundamental skill? Yeah, that's <laughs> that right. Kids need to succeed. Yeah. This. All right. What are you spending on? Mm. You know. Yeah. So look. Also, um, Michael, I did touch on who are the people doing the teaching in these in this intervention part of the pyramid. Yep. These need to be the school's best trained people. Now, in teaching students with dyslexia, we have trained plenty of teacher aides. In Australia, in South Australia, we call them SSOs in the state system and ESOs in others. But So what I don't want to think people think that I'm saying is that your teacher aides don't have the knowledge. They can go get the knowledge. But what intervention has traditionally looked like in Australian schools is uh, the teachers assign some time from a teacher aide or a support person Support person comes in. I'm taking taking Michael today. Yeah, what do you want me to do with him? Oh, can you just read him that and do some scribing for him? And you know, that is not intervention. Yep. Right. Um, so what we end up with is we're putting people who have had the least training in how to remediate difficulties like reading and spelling with the most needy kids, and that's a broken model. Mm. And and you've got to look out for it because as a parent, you. You won't know this. No. This is why it's important in my mind that we're doing this yes. episode because yes. you don't know this stuff as a parent. No, you don't. And I remember when I was a parent and, you know, this was before my kids were identified. Yep. The school's approach to that intervention was to get the grandparents in or the parents <sighs> yeah. to read with the kids. Yes. So the kids who were having difficulty would have their grandparents come in or volunteers. Yeah. To read with them. And you know what? I thought that sounded good. Because oh, I thought, great. oh, my mother-in-law would love to do that. Yeah. She gets to bond with the kids. The kids get extra reading practice. Like it it sounded like a positive. Yeah. Or um, uh, the class has got a dog. We'll let Michael read next to the dog. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is these people aren't trained in teaching reading. Yeah. Now, if this kid's a proficient reader, great. We get all the vocab and all the great literary, literary stuff and fantastic. If you're a struggling reader and you sit next to a grandparent who goes, well, look at the picture. Yeah. Uh, read around it using all that three queuing claptrap, which mm. is still alive in schools. All you're doing is exacerbating that kid's reading issues, aren't you? Yep. Yeah. 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 So I'm not sure. I mean, do people do still do that? I would say and it's probably happening. Read. Yeah, probably. Um, the, the schools that have gone hard down the science of reading path have actually said, we're stopping that. We can't just have anyone listen to kids read because mm. this is the damage that can be done. Mm. Um, 
So, and if they do have grandparents or parents read with kids, they train them on how to get a kid to decode, mm. how, how to get that kid to use those effective strategies for word identification mm. when they struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that is a red flag, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, a red flag, but also a positive to say, if you're, if in this interview the principal or the teacher is starting to talk about this approach, how importantly, mm. how, how important it is, yeah. the fact that they have this intervention, they're all good things. Yes. The fact that their teachers or SSOs are well-trained. Yes, we have our guns running our intervention. Yep, yeah, our best teachers are the ones that do this. Yeah, 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 that's right, because these kids need the best of us. Mm. Yeah. What other positive things do we want to be hearing from schools? Well, anything that indicates that the school is teaching to a, to a tight scope and sequence. So we teach structured synthetic phonics here. We do phonological awareness work with the kids, all of them in the beginning, and then the kids who need it later on in intervention. Um, so, you know, anything to indicate, like I said, we're teaching to a plan mm. that... Um, Kids will get this here, 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 here. If they don't, they're into intervention. But none of this kind of, um, you know, we're meeting them where they're at and we're teaching to 20 different skill levels. Um, decodables, what type of readers are coming home? We want to hear that in the early years. It, well, actually, parents, we want to hear it. We're not sending books home straight away. Okay, now, um, traditionally, readers have gone home immediately. And that happened under the whole language balanced literacy kind of regime because it was about exposing kids to reading. But what was going home were those levelled and predictable texts. The schools that are sending home decodables wait for a while until they've taught, well, in some phonic structures, S-A-T-P-I-N, and only then are there enough words in a reader, even though they're not war and peace. We've talked about decodables in the last one, mm. but there will be a delay. Readers will come home when kids have a certain amount of code in them. Yep. And it might not be readers straight away. It might be cards with with um, certain words, phonically controlled words. But you want to hear that we send home this type of reader, a decodable or a phonic reader. We don't send home these others in the beginning because we'll just teach kids to guess otherwise. Uh, if the parent wants to know, well, does that mean can I still read to them? Absolutely you can, right? You could... You <laughs> Do you, read. Yeah, you can Please read. Do. Yeah, you can read War and Peace to them as yeah. my go-to example. That's <laughs> fine. But when it comes to them reading, this has to be done in a particular way. Mm. Yeah. So, yes, that's a big one. So, parents, don't bang the table if readers aren't coming home straight away because if the school's into the science of reading, they won't come home straight away. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, this sounds like you're describing some sort of school utopia. You know... Yeah. Is this possible? Yeah, there are do these, these schools. schools exist? They do. They do. But unfortunately, they're not even close to everywhere. Mm. But um, they're growing. So I, I guess in some ways this, this blog is unfair because it does create the school that's doing everything. And I could count, I'm holding one hand up, the schools that I know of, there'd be more of them, but schools I know of, it's, you know, it's around, well, I've been lucky enough to work with five or six of them. You know, um, in South Australia or in Australia, well, well, yeah, Bentley West interstate. But yeah, you know, I know they're around. If you go and have a look at the dyslexia documentary um, outside the square, yeah, you'll see schools that were on this journey a long time ago. And you don't have a complete inventory of all these schools. This is just no, your experience. No, it? I don't. I, you know, I know of schools that are using um, Allison and my program in Tier Three. Yep. You know, and and. I, I think where you find a good where you find a school using evidence based intervention, you can't help but not you know the, yeah. the school will be doing tier one pretty well too because the expertise is making its way into the school, and this is usually how it happens. An intervention teacher goes and gets really well trained and comes back and goes, "Hang on, well you know we've got kids around walking around talking about open and closed syllables, but it's not being talked about anywhere else." Mm. You know, so it trickles down. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so what about parents, because I've seen this before, what about parents who don't have much choice? So yeah. there aren't a lot of these schools around no. and I just need to go to the school. Maybe I'm in a regional area. Yeah, that's and what I, comes to mind with me. I, yeah. I just need to go to the school because this is the only school. Now, I've met quite a number of parents that... Uh, kind of, have, they've tried that system and it hasn't worked or they're a bit 
suspicious of the education system. So they think, well, I'm going to go all for an alternative school mm. because it's got to be better, doesn't it? So I'm going to go to a Montessori school or a Waldorf school or, you know, another mm. type of school. Yeah. Do you are you aware of their approach to reading, or, or is there? Are you aware of any of those alternative schools that use the science of reading? Like, is there? Yeah. Should we use caution here, or should yes, we go we and meet them should. and ask the same questions? We need to ask the questions. Um, to prejudge is you know often folly, isn't it? Mm. Um, in my experience, and that's just my experience. Um, I ha- I couldn't say that the read the teaching of literacy has been flash um but you've got to ask Mm. and i guess this is a reason for the blog you you, if you walk into a a montessori or a you know or a steiner school or or whatever they may be doing a bang up job of this because they're using the evidence i'm not saying they don't um but ask the questions yeah i think this is just about ask the questions isn't it yep yeah, uh, are there these key ingredients going on? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and then, unfortunately, what do you do if you're stuck and you don't have a school that has, you know, that you have access to that has this evidence-based yeah. approach? And, and you know, pl- yeah, I think listen to our episode with Sandra Marshall. If that, you yes. find yourself in that position, yeah. <laughs> I, I, Michael, I was prepared for that question, and and mm. my answer was going to be exactly what you said. Go back and listen to that one mm. because that was that was a parent um, who – Sandra was in what you might call a semi-rural town. It's a town of what, uh, as far as primary school goes, three or four. Um, and there would be parents listening to remotely going, wow, three or four, that's a <laughs> bounty. Um, <laughs> but Sandra – there will be parents – Sandra's in a position where she had to start to talk to the school about we can do better here. But Sandra had that that special source of how to do that. But, yeah, there will be parents in a situation where the nearest school is not viable and then they've got to advocate. They've got to start to talk about all right, and try and keep the channels open. How can we do this better? Mm. And many a school has made the, the change into the science of reading based on a parent going in and talking that way. Mm. I wish I could say. I wish I could say all parents have choices. They don't. Yeah, yeah, and, and even within a school, you may be able to talk to your teacher. You know, That's your right. your kid's teacher, because it's certainly been my experience that even in schools where I've been, where they don't have a science approach yeah. to reading, there may be a teacher that does. Yeah, and yes. often that teacher has a kid themselves that that yes. lives with a learning difficulty, and so That's they right. get it, and they. Yes, you know, oh, we've had a couple of those teachers along the way, yeah. and it's such a relief. Yes, you go, oh, thank goodness, somebody understands. <laughs> but you know, and that's great if you're the kid that gets that teacher. Mm. But what a shame mm. that if you don't get that teacher, what a shame the school's set up that way, that that teacher's expertise isn't happening everywhere. Mm. That's the problem, mm. you know. But yeah, they're lucky. But it is. It's a spin of the wheel, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. 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 Can you think of anything else that parents should be on the lookout for choosing a school? Probably one more thing, and we've touched on it. Parents, you want to hear, I believe, teachers talking about, and I've mentioned it, when we're talking about teaching of literacy in the early years, a a very structured and tight and phonics-based way of doing it. You want to hear terms like phonological awareness, if you hear orthographic mapping, just slap a kiss on someone, will you? Well, maybe not. In co- <laughs> um, but you also want to hear what you don't see in the marketing. You want to hear teachers or leaders talk about there are many times in a day where teacher teaches from the front. You want to see tables and seats in classrooms. You don't, you don't want to see huge open areas and schools say, oh, we've actually removed the furniture because we subscribe to a philosophy of teaching and learning where children should be free to move around, mm. right? Um, I mean, crikey, compare it with hot desking in workplaces. Evidence says it's hugely ineffective, right? People need a spot. When kids are sitting down and doing hard stuff like writing, they need a table and they need a chair. So... You want to hear teachers talk about stuff like working memory, attention, 
we teach in this way because we want the kids to be tuned in on us and not distracted by a heap of extraneous variables. We control noise in classrooms. We actually have gone, we use open classroom areas for certain parts of the day, but there are certain parts of the day when we close off and teachers work with their kids on certain things. So we want to, now this all seems bleeding obvious, doesn't it? Mm. If you need to concentrate on a hard task that you're not built to do, you need to be able to focus. So you want to hear teachers talk about how they manage attention, how they manage cognitive load, how they make sure that there isn't too much on kids' minds at any one time when they're trying to get a kid to focus on something. That at homework will come home, it will be worked examples of certain things. Okay, it's not just go home and inquire about something. It's we've taught them a certain step way of doing certain things. Can they practice that? There will be practice and there will be repetition of certain skills, right? Some people will go, there'll be some rote learning. Yep. There'll be some mindless practice, but it's not mindless practice, it's deliberate practice. All this stuff that our system, our educational culture threw out in the 70s and 80s as old hat. Well, not everything, but do you know what, you know yes, what I'm getting at here? I do. Um, stuff that when you sit back and you think about it, you go, well, of course that would be conducive to learning, hmm. Right. And, of course, if this class is open and there's 60 kids wandering all day and some kids writing lying down on their bellies and some kids, well, man, I wouldn't cope well in that environment. Mm. You know, this is not, this is not Google. <laughs> yeah, there needs to be that opportunity to focus. Yeah. Because we're dealing in many cases with kids who are not, not only find it difficult to focus, yes. but because the work is so difficult, they're actively searching for something to distract for a distraction. them. Yeah, <laughs> you that's know, they're right. actually on the lookout yeah. and will see any tiny thing for a distraction. That's exactly right. So to, to remove those is helpful. And you know what? I look at my room here where I tutor and it's full of distractions. Oh, mine's a shocker too. Yeah. yeah. However... This isn't a classroom with 30 kids. No. And when I'm one-on-one with a kid, I can see straight away whether they're paying attention. You can. Or whether they're distracted. Yes. And you know what? Sometimes it's good to have a little distraction and a break. And when I'm one-on-one, I can let that happen. You can. But let's also talk about what's around your place. I'm looking at a word cracker. I'm looking at boxes with beads and counters. Um, So everything in your room, Michael... Well, most things in the room has a point. It's how you, it's what you teach, and this is also interesting. Uh, Salisbury Primary School, um, we're very, are very cognizant of what's up on the wall. Now, if you have a look at this blog, you'll see this excellent writing example. It's called the Writing Subwide Tube Map. Mm-hmm. So, teachers in these schools are going, well, what are we hanging up, and what does that mean for where kids look when we need them looking at us? Mm-hmm. So, what's on the walls in these classrooms might be colourful, but it's a teaching tool. Now, I'm not saying don't hang kids' work up, right? Um, but but you just these schools are a bit more cognizant of what is around the place that might drag the kids' attention mm. away from where it needs to be. Yeah, so when you're doing a classroom tour, yeah. have a look at what they've got on the walls. Yes. Is the place window dressed? Mm. You know, or, or or does everything or does most of what's around the place look like is it does it look instructional? Yes, it can be a celebration of kids learning. But if there's work up, they might be work samples. They might be a how to do something. So, yeah, just just be aware of um, visual clutter, Mm. I guess. Mm. Yeah. So now one thing we haven't covered, which we said we would, which was Hattie's effect sizes. Yes, yeah. So maybe just give it a little explanation of what that is. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't think that a parent will be talking to a teacher about Hattie's effect sizes. Well, some might. Well, they might, Yeah. yeah. But... But they are an excellent little guide yeah. to say what should we be doing? What is effective teaching? Yes. And what isn't? So um, a long time ago now, Professor John Hattie um, was very interested in what explains the variance between kids' achievement in school. Um, so he embarked on what we call a meta-analysis, just which is an overall study of, of thousands of other studies to work out Basically, what stuff do we do in schools that has a huge effect on learning? What stuff do we do in schools that has zero or actually a negative effect on learning? And, and basically, had he ranked programs and approaches, so particular programs and particular teaching approaches um, from those with a very high effect size 
So stuff that's effective, right down to stuff with a low effect size. And it was a really, it was a, it was a watershed moment because um, schools uh, before that, oh, hang on, how, how do I say this? Look, we're all prone to fashion and trend, aren't we, Michael? Mm. There's a lot of trendy stuff going on in schools that look great, but when you really looked at it, you looked at its efficacy, wasn't doing a whole lot. So Hattie has given us a map of uh, to, for us educators to look at and go, Hmm, well, we've done that for a long time, but look, isn't that interesting? Low effect size. So we've talked about effect size of inquiry, and we've talked about today effect sizes of deliberate things like deliberate practice, rehearsal and memorization, phonics instruction, direct instruction, mm. you know, spaced and massed, spaced versus massed practice of a mm. certain task, you know. Uh, I would encourage parents to go to the Visible Learning website and have a look at this. Mm. And we'll have links in the blog. Yeah, I'll in put the those notes. in. And, they're, they're, and, and the blog I'm talking about. Uh, will be in the show notes, and there are links in that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's probably you know it's probably a whole episode on its own. Well, it is, but and, uh, yeah. But, but suffice to say, it's really an eye opener, I think, to look at those. Yeah, because a lot of the things that have the high effect size are the things that are a bit boring that we've been talking about. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Or, or look boring. Yeah, look boring. That's right. As far as a sales pitch goes that's for right. a school, yes. you know, you don't kind of open with, we do lots of deliberate practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do We do spaced <laughs> in deliberate retrieval practice here. Yeah. Look, parents, I want you to understand that uh, kids in these schools are engaged Oh, oh, and look, I have never seen higher levels engagement of engagement than what I've seen in these classrooms that work this way. Okay, um, engagement does not equal uh, many many options about how you do something. Engagement is not free choice in how you learn. Engagement comes from, in a lot of cases, mastery, uh, and then and then. The, expi- the, the the success that comes from being able to do something well because you were taught well, please don't fall into the trap of those well marketed images that look like kids are moving around all the time and doing the a la carte picking education. They they make the poorest classrooms and give the poorest outcomes. Mm. Um, the other stuff that doesn't look as sexy, by and large, it gets the job done better. Mm. But mm. when you think about it, it makes sense why. Yeah, it does make yeah. sense. Yeah. Well, Bill, thank you very much for today. Thank you very much for your blog post. Oh, you are very good, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope it's helpful for people. And look, we've talked about a lot of stuff today. Yeah. Um, and look, I'm if people have questions, feel free for to reach out to us. We've got our links on social media. We've got our contact details. Comment on the Discastia yep. webpage. Yep. Yeah, yes. And you can visit Discastia.com and subscribe so you get updated when we've got a new episode out. Yeah. Um, and really, we'd love to engage. Yeah, we would. Um, look, you know, the fact we're here at six in the morning lets us know this is not our day gig. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll do our best to get back to you. Um, what I hope, Michael, is you know we're not painted as back to basics educational traditionalists because this is not what this is actually about. It's mm. just not that simple. Um, this is about what we know works yep. better for more kids. Exactly. Yeah. That's what yeah. we're after. Yeah. Doing the best by our kids. Yep. So thank you for, for joining us. And, Michael, thanks for indulging me. Thank you. My pleasure, Bill. See you later, everyone. See you, everyone.